Welcome to 202 Creates Month. My name is Natalie Madeira Cofield, entrepreneur and resident for Mayor Muriel Bowser presents 202 Creates. In response to the changing business landscape, we are proud to launch a masterclass series featuring creative entrepreneurs and business leaders who have achieved success to inspire and inform the district's creative economy and community. An initiative of the DC Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment, led by director Angie M. Gates, 202 Creates is an entrepreneurship-focused initiative designed to celebrate, support, promote, educate, and provide access to the district's creative entrepreneurs. 202 Creates programming produces entrepreneurs, provides technical assistance, master classes and seminars, and biannually a cohort model business intensive residency program designed to aid creative entrepreneurs in scaling their endeavors. For more information, please visit www.202creates.com. Now, we'd like to kick off today's program by introducing our featured speakers, Michelle Rice, General Manager, TV One, and Clio TV, who will be led in conversation with Angie M. Gates, Director of the DC Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment, for an engaging discussion on the future of TV, film, and production in a virtual world. Before we begin today's discussion, I will be doing a short biography reading. Angie M. Gates, Emmy Award-winning producer, serves as the director of the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment, where she made history when the District of Columbia government won its first Emmy Award at the 60th Annual National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Award Show. In addition, Director Gates heads up the DC Film Office. Prior, Director Gates served in various roles with DC Mayor Muriel Bowser's administration and transition teams including the traveling chief of staff. Gates has also served as executive producer of the DC Proud 2019 inaugural celebration in honor of Mayor Muriel Bowser's historic milestone as the first female two-term mayor of Washington, DC. Michelle Rice is a 15-year veteran of TV One. She was named general manager in July, 2017. In this role, she is responsible for overseeing and leading all business, operational, and creative aspects of the network. Rice has been named on Cable Facts' Top 100 in Cable, Top Minorities in Cable, and Top Women in Cable. She's also been recognized as a NAMIC Emerging Leader, Broadcasting and Cable Television's Next Wave of Leaders, 40 Under 40 by Multi-Channel News, and one of Multi-Channel News' Wonder Women. She was highlighted as a 2019 trailblazer in Cable Facts's Black History Month special report. Most recently, Michelle shepherded the development of TV One's sister network, Clio TV, an aspirational lifestyle and entertainment TV network serving millennial and Gen X women of color that launched in January, 2019. Here we go. It's lit! This is gonna be amazing. Say hello to the beautiful people. Here we go again. Oh! You're getting really turned up in here. It's gotta be fly, glamorous, and sexy. What more could you ask for? We're not done yet! Oh, yes! Congratulations on Clio TV. That is awesome to you and to Miss Kathy Hughes, who's my mentor. That's <laughs> an awesome, awesome milestone. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Kathy Hughes is amazing and she's also one of my mentors. <laughs> yeah, she's my shero. I uh, have always learned a lot. I, I've often talked about the expression a minute mentor. I'm around her for like one minute and I'm schooled very quickly. <laughs> Uh, so, Michelle, tell us more uh, about your trajectory and your career. You've done some amazing things, but walk us through a little bit more of that, that process to get you where you are today. 
Um, I would say, I mean, no path is uh, straight. I went to college uh, thinking that I wanted to be a journalist um, because I love to write. And so I went to Temple University in Philadelphia, majored in broadcast uh, journalism, which was, so I have a background in production and, and writing. But while in school, did a couple of news internships, and that's why internships are so important. Uh, decided that that really was not my passion, um, particularly after getting some advice from a young uh, black reporter uh, in Philadelphia who said, you know, if you don't love it like this, you you probably shouldn't do it because, I mean, they weren't making a lot of money. It really is a grind. You probably would have to move a bunch of different times. And that just wasn't, I didn't really have a passion for it like that. And so I said, looking around the news uh, station, what does that gentleman do who had a nice office? <laughs> and he was running things and he was the general manager of the television station. And I said, you know, at that point, I decided that I would actually pivot my uh, education and focus on behind, being behind the camera. And I always had the aspiration that one day that I would run a television network. So, you know. And here I am. So um, obviously I, I changed my uh, trajectory from writing and being in front of the camera to then going to USC and getting my master's degree and, you know, sort of really just working my way uh, up the ladder. And so that's really is, you know, my path, um, a, a combination of preparation, internships, a little of luck and a, a lot of grit. Right, right. It's interesting. One of the things you and I both have in common is the internship aspect of things. So internships are absolutely amazing and they serve two purposes. It quickly will let you know what you want to do and what you, what don't, you don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, I had multiple internships when I was in, in college. Interesting enough, uh, my first internship was at WLOX TV and I just knew all day I was going to be a news reporter. Uh, uh -huh. But it's only so much news that's happening uh, in Gulfport. And I must have done a gazillion uh, stories on trash on the beach. But it was <laughs> a completely deadline of getting everything produced and in. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm a senior in college uh, and news reporting is not what I want to do. Interesting enough, uh, my next internship was at the Film Commission in New Orleans. And uh, that, that internship actually turned into a part-time job, 20 mm -hmm. hours a week. And uh, then I knew I loved this. Uh, I was working on Interview with the Vampire. And uh, I was like, okay, this is, this is great. Of course, taping at night, because that's uh, the character of the vampire. Right. Um, and then working <laughs> during the day, um, but I started out as a film specialist. Uh, and when I came to DC, uh, I'm the former general manager of the Warner Theater, the first African-American general manager. And when I walked in there, I was like, this looks so familiar. The building just looked real familiar. And uh, it was a scene from the Pelican Brief, which was another film that I worked on. And it was at that particular moment when I was like, this is how life comes full circle. So that internship actually led me on a trajectory and a career path of being a film specialist out of college to being a film commissioner today. So I encourage uh, people all the time, do the internship so you'll know what you want to do. And, and what, what you don't, don't want to do. do. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And actually getting into the industry, I got in through a, a literally was looking through a magazine and saw an ad that said, you're interested in being in the cable television business. And I was like, yeah. And it was for an organization called the Walter Cates Foundation, and they were doing uh, paid internships in television management. And I applied for the program and that I got my first uh, job at BET um, through the Walter Cates program. Doesn't exist anymore. It's still a foundation that really focuses on supporting uh, diversity efforts in the, in the industry. But this management program really was what helped propel me into um, the role that I'm in today. Well, let me ask you this. We've talked a little bit about your professional career. Uh, since COVID, uh, we all have been doing a lot of quarantining uh, at home. So yep. how have you been spending your time? Have you been been watching? I mean, you're producing and general managing uh, these networks. Have you actually <laughs> been, been binge watching any television shows? 
I mean, as you probably uh, are aware, television uh, viewership across the board is up. So that's that's good for all of us in this business. Um, and I would say I'm certainly adding to that number as as, as is my family. Um, so there've been a lot of really cool things. And obviously being in the television business, I consider myself and need to be always a student of TV. And so I'm always trying to find out what are the coolest things I every Monday morning talk to people and what did you watch over the weekend? Um, I would say at the top of COVID, I was totally binged uh, the Ozarks was just a great, great uh, series. I started it, stopped, and then people kept talking about it. And once I started, I couldn't let it go. Such a great, um, such a great series. Most recently, um, uh, I've finished, well, got up to speed on Pea Valley, um, which is a really cool show as well. Um, so there's so many things uh, to, to watch in TV. And yeah, I, even going, going back and watching shows that have been on the air for a long time, but I just didn't have time to watch it. Like Billions is another very well done, very well written show uh, that I've started binging as well. So yeah. <laughs> now let me <laughs> ask you this. Um, there's uh, the interesting world of entertainment. It's the business side uh, and then there's the creative side. But quite mm -hmm. often uh, a lot of us that's in the industry uh, wear dual hats. You know, we have that creative uh, right. inner energy in us as well, uh, the inner person. So let me ask you, would you consider yourself a creative? I, I noticed that beautiful piano in the background. <laughs> so uh, do you play a tune or two? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I played the piano for many years as a child. Um, I still play. Uh, my son plays. I am definitely someone that is a lover of, of music. So I do consider myself a creative at heart. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, the reason why I initially went into journalism as a undergraduate major was because I love to write. Um, and then moved to California. And one of the ways that I helped pay, you know, through my master's degree program is I worked at, I worked at a studio. And one of the things that I did, I was a, a reader. I read a lot of mm. scripts. I did story analysis for, for uh, studios and a lot of different odds and ends uh, jobs. So I definitely have an inner creative, I, you know, and I write all the time still. Um, it's just... For me, it's it's catharsis. Playing music, I can sit at a plant, piano at the end of a you know bad day, and you can really kind of escape into music, either playing it, listening uh, to it, or watching a really good film, or sitting and writing or reading a book. So it's definitely something that I, I like to do to unwind. So yeah, I would consider, I definitely have an inner creative. <laughs> good, good. Well, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, don't be surprised if you get a call from me saying, hey, we have this emancipation show coming up. We would love to have you play the intro, you know? So don't Girl, be surprised. No. <laughs> Don't be surprised we pull. Uh, taking it too, you're taking it too far. <laughs> Don't be surprised if I pull that artist out of you. Uh, the running joke uh, with uh, the staff and I are like, we, we, we want to get a Grammy. So we are uh, Emmy Award winning television team, but you may be our, uh, our step towards that Grammy. That's funny. <laughs> uh, so with COVID, I know things just like st suddenly stopped, you know, production came to an unexpected abrupt end. Um, we've noticed over the past month or so, productions are slowly uh, coming back uh, to not what would be considered normal, but just starting to exist again. So uh, fill me in on what's happening uh, over at Television One and your networks. Have you all actually gone back on set? And if so, what type of measures are you, are you taking? Uh, yeah, late late July, we went back um, on set, and obviously we were anxious to get back uh, to production as safely and as responsibly as possible. Um, and so, you know, leading up to that, both you know our legal team, 
uh, have been working with, I mean, because things are so, are pretty complicated. Obviously there are COVID-19 uh, guidelines for health and well-being that we have to follow with respect to the union, SAG-AFTRA, mm -hmm. um, as well as the production companies. Our corporate uh, office has our own uh, guidelines for COVID. Um, and then you have state and local ordinances that may have guidelines for COVID. So it's, it's a lot of, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of things that have been added on to the production uh, process, but rightfully so uh, in the middle of a pandemic trying to go back into business. And so, as I said, we, we did go back into production with a, a movie, Don't Waste Your uh, Pretty, which is based on Demetria Lucas's book. Um, we shot that in Georgia. And so obviously we had to make sure that we were adhering to those guidelines locally. And I mean, some of the things that, you know, some of the best practices recommended, obviously, before you come to set, you have to be tested. Um, and throughout the production, we were testing to make sure that people were well when they got there and continued to stay well um, throughout the production. And so we had a COVID supervisor on set who, you know, made sure that we were following um, all the guidelines. And we even had a digital stream back to uh, DC where, um, you know, executives here could look and see what was going on on a regular basis and, and monitor. And a casting and even was uh, a table read and casting and, and things like that were done virtually. So we've been very safe and very innovative in how we've gone back into uh, production. And it was very, it was a successful uh, experience. Oh, fantastic. So you mentioned uh, uh, filming one of your last projects in Georgia. So I'm going to put in a plug to film <laughs> in your next project <laughs> here in Washington, D.C. Uh, shout out to our wonderful mayor, Muriel Bowser. She reactivated our film rebate fund. Uh, the film rebate fund was dormant for about five years. And we have a very, very aggressive uh, rebate fund. And the one thing that I pride ourselves on is the fact that we make sure that we use the fund for local production companies, as well as uh, regional and national production companies. And to be honest with you, uh, the minimum spend is $250,000. And when you're doing television and film production, I mean, you can do that in a you know, couple of hours, um, but the mm -hmm. return on the uh, investment, you can get up to 35% back and it's a cash rebate fund. It's not tax credit. So uh, we really uh, took that opportunity and DC is open for business. And like you said, every state has guidance and guidelines because our number one priority is, is safety. But I would love to see the next uh, Clio TV or uh, TV <laughs> One uh, project uh, shot right, right here in DC. Are you all looking um, for new content, by the way? Well, 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 first of all, let me say, Director Gates, we will take you up on that. We would love to have conversations on your, as you said, very, very <laughs> good uh, process and rebate. So we will definitely take that uh, under advisement. Um, right. And obviously, we love uh, the DMV. We're headquartered in the DMV. And um, so that definitely is near and dear to, to our hearts to making sure that we are, um, you know, spending dollars locally. So I wanted to first say that. Consider um, the deal done, consider it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, now what was your question? Cause I wanted no, to, what, I didn't want that to pass by. Look, no, no, right. Like, and that's the thing. And this is, I think what this masterclass represents when you have two uh, minds, you know, uh, I call it often high heels and high places. <laughs> <laughs> you can quickly come up with a, a decision such as that. But I think that there are a lot of people uh, who've had the additional time on their hand and they're creating a lot of content. So one of the questions, are you looking for new content? And um, if so, what's that process? Because I'm sure a lot of people, you know, would love to pitch, but there's uh, certain guidelines and processes that, that they have to go through. Do you need an agent? Do you not? Like what's the standard practice with your, your networks? 
Yeah, and I don't know that there necessarily is a standard. And we're always looking for new and, and, and good and quality content. And obviously, there's some avenues that we proactively pursue. We have relationships with agents and lawyers and people that in production companies that pitch us stuff all the time, and we're already in partnership with them. Um, so that's obviously a, a easy avenue. But for the average uh, content creator, I mean, we have a process where you don't necessarily have an have to have an agent, um, but legal representation of your intellectual property, and I just want to say, stress this enough to creators, make sure you're pr protecting your IP. You know, I have people that will just hit me up <laughs> on Instagram about an idea. Um, ideas are a dime, dime a dozen and ideas are not intellectual property. So when you're out there sharing your ideas and your, you know, you, you really shouldn't do that. Um, so there is a process um, that goes through our legal department for people who don't have legal representation. You can go log on to tv1.tv um, and submit your ideas. They will go through the legal um, process. You sign a release um, and a, then build a relationship with the legal department. And then the legal department then takes uh, that after you know, all of the that work has been done to our programming and development team that then looks at your your IP and decides whether or not it's something that we're looking for. Um, and I also want to say to people, when you're submitting to a network, um, make sure you're, you're aligning your uh, content with what the network is doing. Because I have I've you know been in rooms where I've been um, talking with creatives. And I'm like, you know, TV One is really looking at movies right now. We're really interested in doing X. And then they'll say, but I have this sports show that I just think will be really great for TV One. But we're, we're not looking for sports content. But it's, you know, it's Black athletes. Is this, okay, well, maybe you should go to ESPN. So, I mean, I'm just, that is one thing I have to say. Can't stress enough. When you're trying to submit something and you're trying to get the attention of the uh, network be aligned with what they're doing and stop trying to force something. It's like, oh, these people don't want to talk to me. It's not that we don't want to talk to you, but you're you're trying to force feed your idea. And I keep trying to give you feedback that that's not what we're looking for. So you're not listening. So if I tell you we're listening, maybe if you pitched me a sports movie, if <laughs> I'm telling you that what we're looking for right now is movies, that's something that uh, would get uh, reviewed by the programming team. Um, so every network has sort of a tone, a theme, different things that they're looking for. Some are more reality TV, others are documentaries, some are just a mix of great uh, entertainment content, but make sure you're aligning the things that you're pitching to uh, networks with what they're doing, with what their strategy is, rather than trying to just push out um, a great project. And, you know, and there may be a place for your great piece. I mean, there's so many different great platforms um, right now for creatives to um, directly distribute uh, their products whether it be over the top, OTT, streaming and, and the like. So um, again, don't just try to push things to um, a network and it might not be in that network's wheelhouse, but we're always looking for great content, always. And, and love to break uh, new creatives, particularly writers, directors, um, we're doing that all the time. No, that's awesome. And you know, in this industry, you hear the word, no, no. You know, it's like, you know, over and over and over again. And yeah. uh, sometimes people are, are, are often disappointed by, by the no. You eventually get to a yes, but you made a very valid point earlier. It's like, you know, if a, if a network fo is focusing on drama and you have a sports project, that may not be the route to go. So when you receive a no, it becomes can become, you know, a little disheartening, but you have to do your research first. Right. Um, I think often too, uh, when you look at uh, someone in, in your position and, and how you've made it to the role of, of general manager, I'm sure you've heard no yourself along 
the way. Uh, <laughs> quite often people see you in your current role and they're like, well, that's where I want to be. That's what I want to do. But uh, quite often the bumps in the road that you had to experience to get there uh, prepared you. So uh, right. if you don't mind, can you just like share maybe a, a story of just a struggle that you had to face uh, and just had to overcome it uh, to for forge ahead? Um, well, first of all, I just, I, I'm going to reiterate what you just said. When people see you in a certain role, they, they think that you just, you know, I, someone said, it took me 25 years to become an overnight sensation. Um, it's not, you know, I didn't just arrive here. You're going to have adversity. You're going to have no's. I've been unemployed, underemployed, <laughs> um, all of those things. Um, but it really is about pursuing your uh, passion relentlessly. I think once I honed in on what I wanted to do, I really had to figure out the path to, um, to get there. And, you know, as a, a woman of color, um, going into the television business, I was in my first jobs, um, you know, we're, we're in the NBC network um, group. I was one of, you know, the few blacks there. And I mean, it can be a difficult uh, and challenging situation in terms of of, you know, ha everyone at work needs to have feel like they belong in having those, you know, alliances at work. Um, and we're now in a, in a, I think, in a in a society where people are um, rightly so focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion in workplaces. But when I came into the television business, those were not, um, you know, they're full departments now that focus on those things. Those things didn't really um, exist, and so. You know, there was a lot of um, challenges um, as a woman of color walking into rooms and really trying to. And also, I said my first job was at BET, even at TV One, coming in and having to present the need for uh, content that was targeted to people of color. When people think African Americans or Black people um, and our lifestyles and our culture is mainstream, and it's not. Black people are not monolithic. My story is different than your story. And my story about growing up in the, in the East is different than someone who grew up in the South or who grew up in LA. Um, there are tons of different stories um, about our culture and our lifestyle that are different than other people. And that, and I always was just shocked that I always had to explain why there was a need for um, black networks um, on the channel lineup. When you have Hispanic networks and they kind of got that like, oh, well, you know, there's a language thing and you have 20 Hispanic targeted networks and one, you know, black network. It's not different. We're not a monolithic um, uh, you know, group of people. We have stories that should be told. And again, thankful that, you know, people are recognizing and realizing that. But I will say also stepping into the role of general manager, one of the biggest challenges that I have, even though I'm an extrovert, um, I'm a very private person. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, you got to be on social media and you got to promote this and you got to go out and speak and do all these things. And I absolutely, <laughs> I don't say that I don't love public speaking, but I gave myself a challenge based on Shonda Rhimes book, uh, The Year of Yes. And, you know, right before Cleo launched, um, I said, you know what, I'm going to say yes to everything with respect to public speaking, because it's, even if I don't want to do it, it's, ha it's something that I have to do. So it was the year that I just pretty much did everything. You asked me to speak, you asked me to be on a piano, on a panel, I did it. And I will say, you know, I'm a lot more comfortable um, with it now. So there are going to be times when you step up into a role um, and there are things that you need to do and you're uncomfortable with them, you're not going to be ready day one, but it's your responsibility to really figure out how to get to a place of comfort. And for me, it was my year of yes. <laughs> and that's why I can do this pretty, uh, I guess, seamlessly today because you know, that was two years ago and I, I'm still kind of trying to say yes to everything. <laughs> I, I want to check out that book as well. Uh, like you, um, I prefer to be uh, behind the scenes as well. Uh, but what 
uh, have an appreciation for is when uh, someone can see you and identify with you and say, you changed my life. You yeah. made a difference. If you can do it, I can do it. And that leads to the yes more often to be out there. Um, and, and, you know, speaking of, of struggles, I remember my biggest fear was losing a job. I just was like, oh, if I lose my job, I'm just not gonna, you know, make it. And, you know, they're really tough times right now, you know, with economics and employment. And uh, when I was at the Sanger Theater initially, uh, these tour buses would pull in, pull out. They would always have the best catering. And that led me to just want to go on the road. I wanted to go on tour, go on tour. Everyone <laughs> that was on tour would say, you know, Angie, it's not what it's cracked up to be. But of course, I'm like, no, I got to go on tour. And of course, two months in, <laughs> I'm like, it's not what it's cracked up to be. I just want to <laughs> be at home. I want to be in my own bed. I want to eat home cooked meals. Uh, and I was on the road for about a year, but um, with touring, you're only as good as your next gig. And when the right. tour is over, the job ends. And uh, at that particular time, I was unemployed and no one, you know, would hire me. Uh, I had a master's degree at the time and you know I felt like I had been very successful and I remember doing an interview at a, at a casino uh, because a lot of the casinos you know have an entertainment uh, arena and so uh, they were sold on the interview they thought I was like absolutely amazing I actually left and had a celebratory lunch thinking I got the gig. What was interesting is uh, you had to take a test. It's like a standardized test. It's just a, a standard practice across the board. Uh, and I did not pass the standardized test. And I've never been good at, at tests. You know, I barely made it with the ACT. I actually took an ACT training course and then scored less <laughs> the next <laughs> like, How does that happen? Uh, but I did not um, pass the test. And and the, the person, you know, that was just in such awe, they were like, we actually had started planning for you to be in this job. And she was like, but what's sad, like you, we can't employ you for any role here at the casino based on this test. And I like jokingly, I said, like, well, can I be a, a cocktail waitress? And she was like, no. And wow. at that moment, I was like, I've gone to school, I have my master's, I've been touring all over the world, and I'm, I'm unable to serve a drink. And it just, <laughs> deflated. Wow. I just was like, can I just put ice in the glass? Like, uh, you know, and so it was at that moment in one of those reality checks where I had to really focus on, you know, who I am and what I am, and what my parents and grandparents, you know, instilled in me. And when I think about, you know, where I am today, and I look at that moment, you know, I'm just like, you know, my career, my life couldn't be defined over this test. But that was one of the hard no's. And of course, yeah. when you get that no, you're like, oh, I'll never recover. You know, I, I can't make it. But you know, it only prepared me and uh, made me stronger. So when other obstacles would come my way, you know, I, I could handle it. I mean, even with what we're faced with today with COVID, um, when I thought Hurricane Katrina was the worst thing that could happen to me by losing every single thing, uh, it actually prepared me for this moment that we're in now. And so uh, I think it's so important when these no's come about and it's repetitive, no, you can't do this or we will not accept. Uh, you know, just everyone has to take that in stride. And it's like, okay, I'll take your no because my yes that's coming is gonna be fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's I, funny, we, we have so much in common because I can <laughs> almost literally tell that exact same story. And I think it's important for, to inspire people in that way. And I love that you, you, you shared that because at the end of getting, you know, my master's degree at University of Southern California, you look and you think I'm going to graduate and there's this pot of gold uh, waiting because I put in the work and I went to school and I did all these things. And it took me a year to find a job because I came out um, during a re recession. 
Um, and finding a job in television is just not that easy. <laughs> but, you know, I definitely went through a year of no's. Um, and until it came to, you know, like I said, it was almost like divine intervention and finding this, um, you know, management program and getting accepted finally a yes that actually changed the course of my entire, you know, life and, and landed me in the cable television um, business. And I remember saying to Spencer Cates, whose father was the founder of this Walter Cates Foundation, and that they were being honored one day at this dinner and walking up to him and saying, you know, I never met your father, but I want to tell you how much your foundation changed my life. Like I, it was, and it was the year that TV One was being honored as a company of the company of the year, and he was at this dinner also being honored. And I'm like, it's 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 ironic that this foundation is being honored at the same day that uh, TV One is being honored because you're responsible really for this black female general manager being there. And that's that's something I, I always try to give opportunities to young people. I always try to do anything that will continue to um, inspire people to pursue their dreams relentlessly, relentlessly. Um, and when, you know, people say, um, to me, oh, you're so fearless. And I always want to define what that means because fearless, fearlessness doesn't mean doing things without fear. Fearlessness to me means doing it afraid. And so when you talk about those prayers from your grandparents and understanding who you are, where you come from and whose you belong to, <laughs> hello, hello. That's, that's about doing it afraid. That's the faith. <laughs> So when people say you're fearless, understand it doesn't mean you do things. It means you take a leap not knowing um, where you may land. No, I love it. I love it. Uh, I, I started, there's this sign actually uh, when I leave at, right at my front door. So whenever I walk out, uh, I see a sign that says uh, home is where the heart is you know, and that's become very important because, you know, I have a mom that I haven't been able to see, you know, and all this time. And I'm like, you know, she's in my heart. So I just have to, you know, feel that I'm at home right underneath that sign uh, is another sign that says faith over fear. Yeah. And every morning uh, or evening, whenever I walk out of my front door, um, it's a constant reminder uh, to have the, the faith over fear. Um, because to your point, so much that we face today and that we all face uh, has been new to us. And so there's been this level of fear. And I love, you know, with, with what you just said, it's moving through that fear, uh, regardless of, of be, being afraid. You know, uh, when I first started, I was uh, with cash money and uh, we would always have this running joke. We may be shook, but we ain't never scared. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. I had to maintain that base, you know, even with uh, where with what we're faced with today. Michelle, let me ask you this, and I and I think that um, you know the credentials are uh, amazing and and speak volume. Um, if you were to give two to three character traits that you have, um, how would you describe like character traits that you have that has allowed you to sustain, maintain, and grow in this industry and just in, in, in life per se, you know, what, what would be a, a, just a couple of character traits? Uh, because I think those character traits, you know, has allowed your credentials to flourish and those same character traits, you know, may be what some of us need to just work on with, you know, who we are as, as individuals. Yeah. Um, I mean, number one, I don't take myself too seriously. I don't know what you would call that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I would call it uh, humility. I mean, my my, um, you know, my my mother is from rural Mississippi and my father is from, you know, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, they both grew up in the Jim Crow South and they sent their kids who um, by standards probably of, um, you know, some folks would be, you know, middle class and, you know, more privileged than how certainly they had to grow up. And every summer I spent my summers in rural Mississippi. <laughs> 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 and, 
And I will say that was the best. We, I used to say, my parents don't really like me that much to have to send us all summer to rural Mississippi, but it was the best experience um, in um, knowing who I am. So the authentic, authenticity that comes from knowing who you are um, and the hum humility of not taking yourself too seriously and thinking that you have this privilege uh, because you went to a certain school or you grew up a certain way, it doesn't matter in the end. Um, you know, we all have to answer the, to the same person from my perspective. But I, um, I would say humility and not taking myself uh, too seriously. And also I'm always a student. I just, I always want to learn more. Um, I want to, you know, learn more uh, about the world, about politics, about my craft. Um, I'm always just a student of the world. And so being a constant learner, um, I think is, you know, similar to innovation, but that's, this is my personal uh, thing about really just continuing to innovate as a, as a human being and being a student of the world and a good a global citizen. Um, but you know, for me, I would say humility, um, fearlessness, as I said, and my grandmother absolutely uh, taught me that. She would always, you know, as much as I would hate to go down to Mississippi for the summer, when we were leaving, I would always cry. <laughs> and she would say, and part of me that I hated, I hated flying, and she would say, do not fear, do never, never be afraid of anything. Um, and she always would write me little scriptures and, you know, she was just a very strong woman uh, of faith. And so I definitely, and I, you know, have a lot of faith um, in myself. And um, I know I have a lot of people, you know, praying for me and wishing me well. But at the end of the day, it's faith in yourself and believing in who you are. Um, and I think self-awareness I have had the good fortune to go uh, be, a, be at companies where they really um, stressed continuous coaching and learning um, and being self-aware, particularly as a leader, um, has been invaluable to me. I've gone through a couple of programs, I think, you know, doing Myers-Briggs and a Berkman study that really has helped me understand who I am, what makes me tick, but I'll not only make what makes me tick, but how I can motivate others because my leadership is really about um, motivating others to be their best self. So it's the, it ain't always about me. Um, that's the type of leader I am. Um, it's not always about me. And at the end of the day, if I'm trying to motivate people, I have to understand what motivates them. So understanding my personality and the personality of people who work for me and what motivates them to be their best self every day is one of the things that I really uh, think helps make me successful as a leader. And I'm always inspired when I see people um, at my company grow, but not only, you know, there are people who have left the company and I follow them. I'm so excited to see their growth. Um, I think that's the mark of a, a, a good leader. So people who used to work for you and how they're continue to flourish. Um, so those are just some of the things that I would say, humility, faith, resilience, fearlessness, um, and empathy for other people, 100%. Mm -hmm. Empathetic uh, is key. And when you have empathy for others, sometimes it'll make you change your mind on your own position of things. Um, you've said some wonderful character traits and I think it's all those character traits that have led you uh, to just sustain in life <laughs> and be, you know, be where you are today. And, you know, God bless the grandmothers and our ancestors <laughs> and, those, and those dirt roads in Mississippi, because I grew up uh, in those bayous of Louisiana and the dirt roads of Mississippi. But if it wasn't for that development, uh, yes. that nurturing, uh, if it wasn't for that love uh, and the, the spiritual trajectory that I was placed on, uh, it's no way that I can be where, where I am am today. Uh, and I'm so thankful. Uh, I remember when I was moving to DC, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to the big city. <laughs> <laughs> going to the big city uh, right. in, my, in my Southern accent. Uh, but it uh, prepared me um, just having those 
hardcore morals. Um, one of the things that was expressed to me um, by one of my mentors as well was making sure that whatever you do from a career path perspective aligns with your morals. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was important because I've been in situations where I am, you know, reporting to an office and we weren't morally aligned. And, you know, I like today with where I am, I don't even feel like it's work. Like, you know, I, it, it doesn't feel like work. And we have such a wonderful family environment here where we just take care of each other. Mm -hmm. And I think from a leadership perspective, you're right, it's all different personalities. I probably have 10 different personalities just <laughs> in this one unified body alone. Right. Uh, but it's, you know, all the, the all different personalities and uh, a leader is only good as the team. You know, and I often talk about we win in championships, we're making history. The only way we can do that is, uh, you know, everybody doesn't have to be the best at the role, but they have to be good and striving for the best. And I think that that's uh, always key and always uh, important. And it's just important from a, a leader to learn from the people that they're working with. Uh, one thing that is key, a leader doesn't know it all. Any leader, you know, feels that they know it all, uh, probably shouldn't be, be leading. So uh, the things that you have said um, are, are very key. And the things that you have said can lead to resilience. You know, I'm walking away with a, a major impact uh, from this conversation. And I'm sure as others that are, you know, gonna listen to this, over and over again, the impact of, of what you're saying. So um, I have to ask you this uh, before I let you go. Um, you know, I, I have this playlist that I keep trying to add to. I, like you, I'm a fan of music uh, and I have a playlist. Uh, I call it the COVID quarantine playlist. So it, it, can you share a few songs uh, that uh, we, I can add to my, my playlist? Uh, I've added uh, Go Go, of course, that's the, the top of it. Uh, recently, Mayor Bowser and the council made Go Go the official music of why Washington, D.C. So I, I keep it cranking. Uh, <laughs> keep it cranking. Uh, what are a couple of songs that I can add to my, my playlist that you listen to? Well, I, I mean, I, I got to tell you, I listen to all kinds of music. My kids laugh. Um, we were in the car one time and my, my kids are used to it, but I had my nephew and he said, <laughs> Auntie, you know every song on the radio. Like it could, you'll go from Tasha Cobbs, you'll know the gospel song, but you'll know Roddy Rich, <laughs> the rap. I mean, that's what happens when you have kids that are all different, you know, ages. So, you know, I, my playlist is, I call it, you know, I love 90s, 80s and 90s hip hop. Okay. So I love old school music. I love Frankie Beverly Mays. I love new, Neo Soul. I would put her, you know, and SZA on your on your playlist. Anything by them, but uh, you know, and then obviously, like I said, gospel. I love gospel music. Um, you know, that's been. I mean, one. I won't say a struggle because I still do church virtually on Sundays. But you know, that is my day of. Uh, the week to kind of regroup and go back, get ready to go back on Mondays, fully, you know, uh, loaded and red, locked and loaded. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I, if you probably, if you don't have it already, uh, of course, I'm a Megan, I do like Megan Thee Stallion. I, I won't say this, this recent song that she has a little over the top, <laughs> but I am a, a fan of Megan, Beyonce, um, Jill Scott, um, and I now, you know, being a resident of the DMC, do listen to Go Go Music. We just mm -hmm. did a great documentary on uh, yes. TV One on Go Go Music, the Beat Don't Stop, that yeah. we hope to to offer in DC at one of there's drive up movies and, uh -huh, and the pull, of, pull up pull up and park, yeah, yeah, yeah. Park so up. we're hoping to feature. Uh, you know, the beat don't stop and really give a nod to to go go music. As you know, our parent company is Urban One and we own radio stations in the DMB. And so go go is definitely in the DNA um, of our organization. And so we 
definitely shout out to Go Go Music and to Mayor Bowser and all the great things that you all are doing in DC. Thank you. Well, I can help you with that pull up and park. <laughs> <laughs> in Urban One, uh, it was a 40 year celebration, I believe. Uh, with yes. Ms. Uh, so yep. congratulations to the entire team on 40 years. Thank uh, with you so that, much. Uh, umbrella. So I just want to uh, thank you again. I want to thank Mayor Bowser for letting us do what we do in the 202. Uh, <laughs> platform uh, to showcase talent uh, such as yours. I also want to thank uh, all of the entrepreneurs and creatives uh, across all eight wards of Washington, DC. Uh, this is our 202 Creates Month uh, that we're celebrating for the month of September, uh, but the creatives here in DC are so hot, we got to celebrate it all year round. But Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. And I can't wait what your future holds. Uh, I, I think uh, I have to stay tuned because uh, with those character traits you shared uh, <laughs> and looking at your credentials and, and uh, what you have done in the past, what you're doing presently, I know your future is very bright. So thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much as well. And I, I just want to just say one final piece uh, to creatives. I know it's been very, you know, difficult during this time. And, you know, I want everyone to just don't get stuck. So, you know, figure out other things to do to continue to hone your, your craft. If you're a writer, maybe start producing content. You could do short form content. If you're an actor, maybe start writing. So there are ways to continue to learn, to continue to, um, you know, sharpen and hone your craft and, you know, don't get stuck. Follow your passion. The, the business is here to stay. We're, this is a bump in the road. And, um, you know, together, as everyone's been saying that, to get, we'll all get through it together. We've been collaborating more. We've been figuring out innovative ways to, to, to keep going. Um, I have a friend, Tressa, who's doing movies mm -hmm. in the DMV. Um, and again, so we're really figuring out how to collaborate and to keep moving forward. And so don't get stuck. This is a bump in the road and that's the opportunity, hopefully, rec to reclaim some of your time to do some things that will really help keeping you uh, to, to propel, propel forward. So that's all I want Thank, to say. I think those are, that's definitely words of wisdom and Mega Minds Media, uh, Tressa is amazing, amazing. I've enjoyed working with uh, Tressa uh, as well as Chuck West with uh, District, District Films. Uh, we have some wonderful talent here. And to your Absolutely. point, we have to uh, continue to remain focused. And for all of us, all the creatives, uh, including you and I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> self-preservation is key. And what's just as important is our, our mental health and uh, remaining mentally focused, mm -hmm. mentally uh, grounded, and also maintaining our physical focus and being yes. physically grounded. And I, I, this is an expression since we were talking about grandmothers earlier, uh, the model that we can stand on is this too shall pass and uh and and it will so thank you so much again for joining us and uh, thank you for having me i look forward to us uh meeting uh once the COVID climate is over <laughs> uh, as well thank you so much take care stay safe to you and your family you too thank you so much thank you again to our speakers michelle rice general manager of tv1 and cleo tv and Angie M. Gates, Director of the DC Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment. And to you, our audience, we hope you enjoyed the discussion and remain connected to 202 Creates by joining us for our next featured masterclass on the future of music, featuring Tuma Basa, Director of Hip Hop at YouTube and two-time gold artist, Tone P. Learn more about our exciting events all month long during 202 Creates Month online at www.202creates.com. Thank you again for joining us.